Eric didn't work out something where he say people put two piles over here or just pick up 10 cubic yards because you come back and it's 12 or 15, how do people know? And you don't get anything, you know? And, and so those things are gonna have to be worked out. And so uh, I, I, want, I want your help in working it out. <laughs> Thank you, Commissioner Tillman. Well, I like to say that the only thing between me and my fried chicken is uh, Commissioner Wynn. <laughs> so uh, I hope you're going to I hope you're going to close it out to me. Commissioner so the, Wynn, go right ahead. Most of the questions have oh, been wow. answered. By the way, I'm Thursday, Jared, okay? I have a Thursday pickup. Um, and and I, I'm so glad we're addressing this. I'm happy that this is happening because I finally got past the garbage, household garbage and household uh, recycling problems. Finally got that organized. But the yard debris was what I was still getting calls on. So I'm glad that you're going to take that over. And that's going to be the same pickup day as their gar household garbage, right? They don't need to put it in a can or anything. Is 10 cubic yards the size of a washer and dryer? By size of your car. Oh, wow, that's big. Yeah, that's that's big, big, <laughs> Commissioner Jones. Uh, it's, it's almost a fail-safe catch-all that you won't see that. If you, if you see that happen, you've probably got to have your strike force thing and, and a blight issue or a move-in move-out issue. That's the only thing you can see. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Now, just in case Jermaine... Make sure we get your phone number so we can put on speed dial just in case. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm glad you said it. Just one point of privilege. Ms. Lucas, uh, class of 94 Northeast, the new general manager. So just so you know that. Well, you should have said that start. We would be out of here already. Uh, <laughs> Comm Commissioner Wynn, uh, thank you for those comments. And I guess my chicken's gone. Let's see if I can save the mashed potatoes and green beans, Mr. Howell. Uh, Quickly. As someone who poured lots of yard, cubic yards of concrete, three by three by three is a cubic yard. So if you're asking what 10 cubic, feet, 10 cubic yards is, it's 10 by 10 by three is just a little bit over. So that gives you a basic idea, but call me if you have a question and I'll help. <laughs> okay. Have I crossed out my whole lunch yet or does Commissioner Watkins have a question? You got a question, Commissioner? Oh, thank goodness. All right. Uh, we've got a motion and a second on the floor. All those in favor of the motion, please say aye. Aye. Opposed, nay. Motion carries and as we be sent to consent agenda. At this time, we're going to be in recess for 30 minutes. Uh, and we'll start back uh, approximately, let's call it uh, 1 o'clock um, on item G. Thank you for patiently waiting. We're now uh, out of recess and back into our committee meetings, uh, committee of the whole. We're going to move immediately into item G. Item G is a resolution authorizing the mayor to execute a fifth amendment to the master solar energy procurement agreement and Cherry Street Energy for the construction of a new solar array project at the animal shelter, provide solar power improvements at no added cost to Macon Bibb County. Uh, that motion is uh, sponsored by Paul, Commissioner Paul Bronson and myself. Commissioner Bronson, may I get a motion? Motion by Commissioner Bronson. Can I get a second? S second by Commissioner Wynn, who also would like to co-sponsor. Is that why you had your light on? Okay, we duly noted. Uh, we have a, any questions in that regard? Questions. Hearing no questions, all those... Oh, you got to hit your light there, buddy. Okay, it's go ahead, on. Commissioner Jones. So tell me about the solar panels and... I'm all for uh, clean energy and all the things we can do, a combination of things. But what, what are these solar panels going to do? They're providing what? Energy they're gonna, they're for the building or what are they doing? Uh, we, we have them already in a couple of different areas and we're actually uh, looking at those for other potential. But uh, for lack of a better term, they're to save money. Uh, and also to put the solar panels on there is going to greatly reduce the amount of um, energy that we have to spend with, our, with the local company. It will store the energy and we get a better rate uh, on, on the price. We so do that right now through uh, at least the, uh, the new sheriff's office on Walnut Street has that and we've seen, uh, seen some savings from that. Uh, but basically it's just going to capture the uh, free energy of the world, uh, store that, and we're going to get a reduced rate on our energy and power bills. And this is no cost to us. Um, 
and that's why we're recommending that. But any further questions we have to answer by Dr. Moffitt? Yeah, further question is, so it's a supplement. It's not a replacement. It's just a supplement to what we have. Anticipate a serious energy savings from that. Yeah, we already all have for it. Sheriff's Annex, and it is my goal that um, as we move further along with the ESCO at the end of the year to um, do a work session on this so you can go ahead and see it. So we have this scheduled for the animal welfare, and there are two other buildings I think they're in the work. So I think Centriplex is one of them, and um, forgive me, but it's, it's another building also that Rob has talked about. The mayor has inquired about uh, possibility of train and Booker T also. Um, as those two facilities come online, so we're looking at growing this program. Yeah, it's uh, I'm all for it. The southeast is good for solar energy, but it's uh, I'm all for it as a supplement, not a replacement. Right. Uh, thank you, Commissioner Jones. Any other question in that regard? Hearing no questions, all those in favor of the motion, please say aye. 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 Opposed, nay. That motion carries and will be sent to consent agenda. Uh, commissioners, let me see. Item H on, on today's agenda, I'm going to remove that from consideration today for two weeks. Uh, the, the only change is there was a, a monetary change because of the contract and the number of years we're in that changed a, a financial number there, and I don't want to put that on you at the last minute for, for exhibit. Uh, we're already a tenant uh, month to month at that location. Uh, we need to solidify that so we have a permanent place for energy defense, and it made a difference there, about $6,000. Uh, and I don't want to just change that in the middle of a meeting and have questions from commissioners. It's not so urgent that we have to do that today. So unless you want to discuss that specifically, we'll move that for two weeks for further consideration, and we'll have the amended exhibit sent to you for approval at the next commission meeting, if that's okay. So I'm going to remove that item from consideration today, and I see no lights on. Uh, we'll move on to a couple other things. The dedication of road. Uh, this is an ordinance to dedicate a portion of Hightower Road as Apostle Ernestine Brown Sherrard Way in honor of Apostle Ernestine Brown Sherrard's contribution to her community. Uh, this is sponsored by Commissioner Elaine Lucas. I'll let her make that motion. Um, I so move. It's co-sponsored by Commissioner uh, Watkins since it's in its district. Okay. We got a uh, motion by Commissioner Lucas and a second by Commissioner Watkins. Uh, Commissioner Lucas, you'd like to be heard on that. Yes, sir. Um, Apostle Ernestine Brown Sherrard um, uh, started out as a registered nurse in Atlanta. And then she uh, moved to Macon, she and her family. Um, both of her daughters are ministers, um, at, which is, is interesting. And the uh, younger daughter has taken over since uh, Apostle Brown's uh, death, untimely death uh, a few years ago in a single uh, vehicle accident over in Houston County. <coughs> the younger daughter, uh, Dr. Christina, uh, Sherrard, who is a um, former graduation coach, counselor. She has her earned doctorate, and she uh, is the minister at the church where her mother, that her mother started. And so uh, because of all of the different things that Apostle Ernestine Brown Sherrard did in the community and helping people, and because she just never, she just did it in her own way. She didn't, you know, make a big deal out of it. She just helped an awful lot of people. And so, uh, and by the way, her sister was my uh, college, her younger sister was my roommate in college at Savannah State. So uh, it's my honor to present this to you and ask you if you would support dedicating that portion of the, of the road in her honor. Thank you, Commissioner Lucas. We do have a motion and a second. No further discussion. All those in favor of the motion, please say aye. Aye. A motion nay. Opposed nay. <laughs> that uh, motion carries unanimously. We sent the consent agenda. And uh, Commissioner Lucas, if you have some members of the family that would like to be present next Tuesday, uh, we'll have them uh, present during that uh, item of vote again. Okay. <clears throat> We're going to move on to uh, informational items. We have a, uh, a couple of informational items. Uh, the first one may take just a moment. I wouldn't, uh, if you give me deference, I'd like to go ahead and move on to C because that won't take very long uh, on the franchise fees. These are informational items. Um, informational items are something we're bringing to you to get additional information so it's a working process. At any point in time that we have a, a item on the information only, we can change that to a... Um, item that you can vote on if you so choose, but I want to give you as much time as possible. Uh, the franchise fees, we're still making changes to that uh, document. We had, um, 
we compare that document with something we already had, and since we're no longer doing collections, uh, we don't want to lock anybody down on prices on that contract, and we sent you out a preliminary contract. Uh, we have a couple of changes to that that I want to bring back before you in two weeks. Uh, we will send that out to you so you can look at that, but this is franchise fees because we are um, wanting to set up a number of companies that can come and make and for commercial trash, to pick up commercial trash, uh, and they will be going through a licensing permit that we will grant them a franchise agreement, and it could be, um, the number could be determined. We currently have four, I believe, that service make in Bibb County right now. Uh, we would um, retain a fee for a license permit, and then they would set their fees like they generally do with their own customers, and Bibb County would receive 5% of their collections based on those commercial garbage. Uh, that is another funding mechanism for us uh, since we're getting out of the trash business to use to continue the great work that we're doing with our solid waste department, which will be rolled into our other departments according to the solid waste plan. So I'm not sure if the Attorney Groover needs to say anything else in that regard today, but we want to make sure before we present something to you that we give you uh, the entire document. I know Commissioner Watkins has sent a question over about one of those, uh, brought a couple other things to our attention, so we don't feel comfortable bringing that to you now. But we do want to give you as much information as possible. Commissioner Watkins, you have something on that one? And I guess that kind of might serve as an answer to my question because like I said I had quite a few. But maybe it might help us all if you walk us through the thought process a little bit. I guess I'm understanding that it says every developed business premise would pay a, a fee to Megan Bibb County for commercial garbage collection. And you know what I'm Actually. Uh, the concept, and this is why we probably have to come back, the concept would be that if somebody is a commercial hauler, like right now there are basically four commercial garbage companies working businesses in Macon, in downtown. And that the way the code reads right now, a business can either use us or use one of them. And they, the commercial uh, garbage companies don't pay us anything other than an application fee. And it's very common in the industry for them to pay a franchise fee to the local government. We just, we've never done it. So the concept here would be that uh, the commercial uh, hauler would go through an application process like they have to do now. They got to do that now with public works director to say, I want to be on your list or whatever. They would pay us 5% of their gross, collect, uh, gross collections every month, which is standard in the industry. And then they would enter into a contract like they're doing now with the business owners. So we wouldn't actually be charging the business owners an additional fee because we wouldn't be servicing them. So that's the concept, which is why we have to come back, because you're correct, in the current ordinances, which are spread out all between solid waste and landfill, we would be charging the business owners in addition, which is not what we want to do. So we're, we're going to come back to you on that. Does that answer your question, Commissioner? Yeah. Okay. I'll wait for the new one to get a better understanding. Yeah. Thank you, Commissioner Watkins. So we'll go ahead and move on to these other two. Um, like we said earlier, preface our remarks is we know that um, these informational items can sometimes, if you have enough support, move to a agenda item that we vote on, and that's certainly okay. But this is a opportunity that we have to get more information. I know at least on uh, item B, there's been several uh, commissioners that want to add friendly amendments and, and back and forth on taking some things out before we have to do that in an open commission, commission meeting. We'd like to have some discussion on that openly and then come back and bring a document so we're all on the same understanding. So I know that on item B, there's been several uh, on the alcohol. But we'll begin with item A. Uh, this is a resolution requesting immediate action to reduce the overall jail population during the COVID-19 pandemic to allow for improved social distancing, safety, and health care. Uh, this is sponsored by several commissioners, including Commissioner Virgil Watkins, uh, Commissioner Al Tillman, Commissioner Paul Bronson, and Commissioner Lane Lucas, according to the documentation. So uh, I've received a copy of a resolution, I believe was, I'm not sure who drafted the, the resolution, uh, but I have received a copy of that resolution, and uh, it's on for informational purposes uh, today. And I think I see uh, Commissioner Lucas, her light on. So if, if you want to start the conversation, we'll have Commissioner Watkins explain why he's making this proposal. Mr. Watkins, you want to start the process on this? Yeah. Uh, you're the one that circulated the email visually, so I, I'm, this is your deal. Yeah, I'm sorry. I thought I heard you say Commissioner Lucas. I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, and thank you, thank you for allowing this conversation. Um, <clears throat> I understand that talking about the conditions of our jail 
and the conditions and the plights of the inmates within our jail is uncomfortable conversation for the community. But we still need to have it. If this body doesn't have this forward conversation, there's no other body in our community that's going to. Um, as it relates to COVID and our jail, throughout the country, several um, judicial circuits have found that this pandemic has made health made health um, health outcomes worse, as well as the closure of the courts and the uncertainty of the courts is leading to a lot of folks being in jail, none convicted. Um, haven't had sentence and hadn't had their hearing. Courts have been closed or were closed for a long time. Um, in talking with the district attorney, our grand jury has not convened in a while and have more than 600 cases um, that are backlogged that they need to address. Uh, we've got to get these folks back working. Um, but in the meantime, I'm recommending uh, several items to kind of reduce the harm that we're causing. Um, when I talk about reducing economic harm, there are a lot of folks that are in our jail, close to 200, that are there for what they call administrative uh, probation violations. Um, they couldn't afford the fine, um, failures to appear, um, again, administrative as it relates to their probation. Um, and we're still issuing warrants for those types of things, thus contributing to our own problem of having an overcrowded jail. So one of the requests or uh, a section of these requests is for nonviolent people who've committed no harm against anyone else. If they're in there on a probation violation, they owe $85 and they weren't able to pay it and the PO issued a warrant. Let's start hearing them and getting them out. We're not doing that right now and that population continues to grow. Um, also understanding in terms of health criteria that there are folks that are over the age of 60 that have special conditions um, that again, their crimes can be very administrative again no victims, no violence, but they are in our jail and still haven't been convicted of whatever it is they're accused of. Providing ourselves and requesting that the courts hear those cases and when it's appropriate, provide special and conditional releases for those types of individuals. Um, again, we need to expedite the transfers. There are a lot of folks, I think the, the sheriff mentioned more than 70 violent um, offenders in our jail right now that have committed murder or, or some type of violence whose cases have not been solved. They have not been closed out, so they remain in our jail. So creating a process to get our courts back open so they may finish those cases because they wouldn't be in our jail. That's not what the BIB LEC is for, for those violent offenders. Like they would be processed out and sent to the appropriate facilities, but yet because we have not reconvene. Um, and again, like I say, a lot of this is based on probation and parole because, uh, like I say, a lot of these failure to report reports and technical violations are occurring and some of those are economic based. Um, so that's that's a kind of a quick synopsis of what you have before the other documents you have before you. I'm open to any questions or anything else you need clarified. But again, it is a this is anything that we shall do. This is requesting that the, the sheriff's office, the, the appropriate courts in all parts of the making criminal justice system get together and convene and figure out how we can unstick our courts in our jail. But, yeah. Thank you, Mr. Watkins. Commissioner Lucas, you had your light on. Yeah, the, the only thing I wanted to do, I had written down, when I read this, I had written the word supporting. <clears throat> And I think that's important. I think it's implied in the the resolution, uh, the support, but I just would like to see it written as a part of the resolution. Um, a resolution um, in support of immediate action to reduce the overall jail population. I think that says we're all in this together. We want to work on it together. And even though we know what it means, if you don't put it down, 
then everybody won't know. Once they read the support, then the sheriff will then know that, you know, we feel like we're all in this together and working, going on, on the, uh, the same line. So I would just like to see if the other sponsors would like to add that support uh, in there so that they know that we're expecting something to come back. And you've already stated that the sheriff is already working on on that so it's coming back but this would just express our support up front and then also say that we're looking forward to the um, listing of immediate actions so thank that's just a suggestion thank you commissioner because I, I do through. have several areas of concern myself but I'll reserve those comments until such time as all commissioners that have an opportunity to speak uh, but I think we have a light on from uh, Mr. Tillman uh, yes sir Mr. Mayor thank you uh, many advocacy groups, uh, long before some of us have ever gotten here, have always had concerns about the jail. I don't think some folks may even realize that um, there are instances where the sheriff himself can make decisions on uh, letting out uh, nonviolent offenders. Uh, we've solicited over the years before I became a commissioner and reminding uh, judges uh, magistrate judges that uh, a form of bail or bail is not a form of punishment and especially during COVID where it just seems like sometimes people expect or seems like bail is a form of punishment. Uh, earlier uh, Mr. Mayor uh, you said we should have uh, included the jail or new jail possibly in the 2018 splash. Uh, we included public safety in the supply. So essentially the jail is included in that because it is a part of public safety. Uh, many years ago, uh, before I became a commissioner, there was a group that was proposing trying to do a new courthouse, new jail, and it was a caption that they sold this community and public on uh, this uh, penny makes no sense uh, and so the courthouse we didn't get a new courthouse we haven't received a new jail but there are some things that we can do and that is to continue to show I would hope that the sheriff and his department don't see this as we're interfering in his day-to-day -day operations as a elected official but we are offering our support and letting him and his department know that we are concerned and that we hear the issues and problems and we want to try to be as proactive as possible without him saying I need this and I need that because uh, as a uh, elected official and constitutional officer he recognizes that there's a certain amount of money that he receives and I keep going back to this CARES Act funding where um, we've got this money and yet we're still looking to say we want a OLOST. And part of it is 100% rollback, but we also know that maybe the first 28 to 30 million is gonna be, uh, we're looking for it to help public safety, to continue to improve the salaries, maintain uh, these men and women. But I think we need to be looking proactively like this resolution is saying as opposed to paying on the back end when people become uh, sick and ill or start complaining they're sick and ill and, and calling in because they can't work in this jail. And I just hope that we all begin to pay more closely attention to it and see that it's a problem. And the same way, whether it's the grand jury or whether it's the media uh, commissioners at some point, uh, need to do a walkthrough and, 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 and see what's going on because sometimes people feel more comfortable calling on and talking to others. And I've heard commissioners say, well, nobody's called me. I hadn't heard anything. That's not to say that's not an issue or problem. And I think uh, this administration, the way it seems like it is going, that it wants to show this this community and this public that it wants to unite and do some things differently that have been overlooked and haven't been done. And uh, I think uh, in the conversations and the small ones and, and the ones going forward, 
Uh, the mayor uh, appears to be committed to wanting to make these changes and implement and have a true impact. And so uh, I would just ask commissioners to open up their minds and thoughts and let's truly have an impact on things that the public want. And so I yield. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Tillman. Pro Kim Clark. I just got a, a point of clarification or a question of clarification for the public. Is this a... Um is this functionally an urging resolution or, is, or are there changes to the code of ordinance? Urge, the former? Yeah, it's, it's, no, that's okay. We will qualify what you mean as an urging re resolution. Like I say, we don't have, these are constitutional officers. Um, I think the, the most important thing would be Again, these are constitutional officers. We're requesting that they look over these recommendations and make some movements. Cool. Thank you. Good, Commissioner. Anyone else have any questions before I make my comments? And there I probably have more questions after that. But I just want to, first of all, I, I've been on both sides of the equation. I guess, I guess all three sides of the equation. Um, I've represented people who have been alleged to commit a crime uh, as an attorney. I prosecuted people under the Third Year Practice Act as an attorney who worked for the prosecutor's office uh, for five years, six years. Um, I think we're having two different conversations here. One conversation is about holding people in jail uh, that perhaps can be doing something more productive instead of just being in jail on what we call technical violations. The other is trying to relate this to COVID. Um, Actually, this, this resolution appears to be been written back April of 2020, um, some almost, a, I guess, 10 months ago, when I think at the heart of COVID, this would have been some good ideas to suggest, ideas to su suggest. Uh, the jail is not actually overcrowded now. Um, there are a couple hundred from, 300 from being even capacity. I know we saw some pictures a while back. That's the initial intake of people because of the quarantine process. But it's not overcrowded from that standpoint if you just want to look at pure numbers. I'm not alleging that it's not overcrowded because I don't want to have people there. I'd like to close a, a wing of the jail so we can have savings and do some more productive things. So number one, I think this is a little outdated. Um, I think there was some uh, language in the one that I read come out of uh, California and Colorado. I'm not sure why that was inserted uh, or examples or perhaps just a cut and paste. But I, I spoke to the Department of Corrections, the DCS, uh, our chief judge uh, when I got this resolution to kind of see are we already doing some of these things and would it really help uh, overcrowding and, and the answer was a definite no. Um, we weigh probation fees. Um, probation fees are imposed but they're not locked up. People in that jail they're not being locked up solely for probation fees. Uh, this is what I'm told. Um, and uh, they have other violations going on, other pending offenses. Uh, that are going on so they're simply not locked up so one of the resolutions says we should waive probation fees i don't think that gets us where we need to be um, the other is restitution suspend restitution on people because of the covid um, i disagree with that i think that's a improper shift of economic harm to the victim uh, many of these victims uh, were out of money because someone stole something from them and that's why restitution is being granted and they have challenges during this economic time too during COVID. And I certainly don't want to be in a situation where I'm, I'm punishing the victim once again and shifting that burden. The third is child support. Um, child support is never used as a condition of probation. Uh, it's not used to violate someone of probation. It may be another factor why they're in there uh, for money they're behind that triggers that, but it's not the sole reason they're in jail on child support. This is according to Chief Judge Howard Sims um, also suspending special conditions. Uh, the things that are mentioned in this resolution are not special conditions. Uh, they're not special conditions and they're, and they're specifically um, indicated on a case by case basis. Uh, suspend reporting. I think one of the recommendation, recommendations was in here was to have somebody do a walk up hearing to show up. We're asking people who don't show up for probation to come in for a hearing. That's just not going to be something that's practical. They're already failing to abide by the guidelines and to show up. So I think that's something that's very unrealistic. The transfer request, request um, frequently, I agree, I want to get them out of our jail. When, but when they're convicted or we have a hold on them, we're not allowed to by law. The state right now is not picking up a lot of inmates. Uh, we would love for them to come pick them up and put them in the state system instead of us having to furnish a place for them to stay for, for 
you know, 24 seven with security and three meals and all those things that, that people think they get when they're here in the jail, including medical and treatment that they get. Uh, but quite honestly, we can't force them to do that. It's illegal for us to just let them back out uh, of the streets. We can't force out of state people to come pick it up, uh, pick up transfers either when we have warrants on there. Um, there was a section here about recalling all outstanding warrants. There's really no system in place to do that. There's not a master button you can click and say, we're gonna recall all the warrants. And of course, I know the judges don't wanna recall warrants on someone that may be legitimate when you got victims out there and then something happened that results in a, a, a death. So those are some of the problems I have. Uh, one of the particular officers told me that probation is a right, not a privilege, and um, they made every effort. A lot of these things you, you're talking about, they actually have already done. They're not keeping people over there for these technical violations. Uh, the probation officer is actually going and checking on, on these defendants. So the overcrowding we're talking about, we can have those conversations. I want less nonviolent offenders in jail, and I want them more productive. I think that's a separate conversation. Uh, that could involve um, second chance that I've talked to um, the new district attorney about. It can involve the work release program that we talked about. It can involve ankle mo monitoring where people continue to work and stay there with their families. That's a separate conversation, but I don't think all these um, resolutions are very applicable now in February going on March of 2021 that were in April of 2020 when this resolution started. So those are some of the issues that I'm concerned about. I certainly um, would advocate to the judges I consider allowing um, a couple of these commissioners, if you wanted to, of course you do it on your own, but I'm starting a process where you sit down with our, with our judges, with our sheriff in there, do a task force to figure out how we can work through some of these issues and urge any consideration, anything we can do to help with that situation, I'm certainly amenable to. But honestly, I think a lot of these resolutions are well-intentioned, but not timely. And I really don't think they get to the heart of the issue that you're trying to solve. It's something I certainly can't support in its current form. Um, so I just want to let you know that in advance where I'm coming from. Yes, sir. No. I got Commissioner Watkins and Commissioner Tillman. So a couple things. I, you mentioned the April. So I used a variety of documents to create this based on best practices that other communities have been doing around the country, right? And you mentioned you're, you're referring to the cares of the COVID as if it's over, not I'm not receiving any of that information on the pandemic being over from any place else. So it's still very much a thing. And I guess one of the things about the jail population that stands out is that, again, most of the folks that enter our LEC, the majority are non-convicted, non-violent people. The average stay is two weeks. So you're right back out into the population. Over this past year, folks have went into our jail went in for an average of two weeks and came right back to their families and everything else. Our jail, again, it's been cited by not me, but I believe the grand jury, quite a few reports, that apparently we're not doing the best job ever at maintaining safety and COVID protocols. So not only is there the possibility that outbreaks occur in the jail, that those jail outbreaks can spread out into our larger community. So if we can do a better job, I think what other communities are showing us that we should if we want to curtail the, the spread of COVID. Um, on the probation and parole fees, I think it's important. A lot of people use the DUI as an example of what happens. So if you're on probation and you receive a DUI, right? you go to jail for the DUI, but you also have what they call a probation hold on you. And so you would be able to pay the $1,000 uh, bond or bail for the, for the DUI immediately. But there is no bond amount set automatically for the probation. The PO or whoever needs to make an action to get you out. And by and large, my understanding, based on the numbers, that there's a large percentage, a significant percentage of people in our jail for that exact thing. They have a probation hold that's none dollar amount, and they've been there. And I understand our probation folks say that they try not to let anybody stay in jail over 90 days. That's still a very long time if that's what our standard is. Um, and again, 
with the waiver with the waiver of the fees i think if you read it it's not a permanent waiver or a permanent release of restitution of child support payments but it's an understanding that this is a, a time of economic hardship for many and if the only reason that we're holding you in jail is because you haven't paid five hundred dollars worth of child support or xyz that maybe that at this point in time that's not the best reason to keep you in not saying that you're off the hook for the five hundred dollars we're not saying that at all but we're saying that that is not solely the reason to keep someone in jail and that we could create and i granted our system today and that's what i'm saying our system today has no mechanisms for these type of things but why not it why not is because locally we have not asked Locally, we have not done, but it exists in something that our government could do. And again, I understand that maybe these things would have been better in April, but we are here in February. Another April is coming up, and COVID is still going on strong, I might add. I think I've heard something about, even though we've got a vaccine, that there's a second strand of it. So I don't understand that part of the conversation um and again i guess on the warrant recalls i want to talk about that as well again <coughs> our probation officers issue a warrant if you're a couple hundred dollars or whatever they've issued and our sheriff's department goes and collects you to go to jail and i understand i'm not saying if someone is violent if someone is has victims involved in what they've done everything I'm saying does not pertain to them but if whatever it is they've done is a victimless crime and I get it there are very few crimes that are victimless but if it is why does our process have to be so rigid why can't we do something different and that's what I'm requesting our body look at none of these items are set in stone things that our court shall do but they are recommendations and best practice to use as guidance of ways that we can approve you're telling me that everything is fine at the jail but evidence by what because last time last time that there was any evidence presented it was black mold horrible living conditions people sleeping on the floor and i've received no information to tell me that masks still don't cost 50 cents I received no information that says that we've managed to get everyone off the floor other than you today telling me that and I don't know that doesn't work for me because I can see and I can talk to these same folks and there's something else going on but I, I yield yeah, no, no problem I certainly want to make sure everybody gets heard on the issue and then I'm not like I said I think we're having two different arguments Commissioner Watkins we're saying the same in some sense and throughout my whole last two and a half years of campaigning before I got this job um, I let people know that we had people there in the jail I don't know that anybody is there for a $500 fine that you're saying or $200 uh, it doesn't have anything to do with COVID I can tell you that because there's always people that's been in jail for those types of offenses when you get in that revolving door called probation I'm well familiar with that I've defended thousands of people uh, in that same situation it, it is a trap but it's a trap that they put themselves into initially we're trying to figure out on the back end how to make it uh, more productive for all of us so I, I do think that the uh, I don't think the numbers that you're that you're quoting are, are accurate I, I talked to the chief chief judges especially in Superior Court they have no technical holes on somebody just for that a lot of the people that are in jail for violent felonies or for people who are on probation who have committed allegedly a new felony uh, and they can't get a bond because they're on probation if that's the person you're talking about letting out I certainly cannot agree with that but if you're talking about somebody if there's a soul over there now and their only problem they're in jail is because they're behind on on uh, child support because of COVID and that's the only reason they're in jail I'm all for it I'll be the first person in line to say that I want that to stop because I think there's other options for that but I don't think we have that situation there at the jail when I talk about overcrowding I'm talking about um, we get set 900 people in the jail and we've got a thousand we've been in that situation before where a court order came in I'm not thinking about which we got 900 and something people in the jail we can handle and we got 750 there or 800 on an average basis to me that's not overcrowding I don't know if to you, me overcrowding you're talking about uh, COVID situations where 
we saw the pictures of 50 people allegedly sleeping on the floor, although that wasn't nighttime, that was during the recreation day that they chose to get on some of those tables, according to your sheriff, who was elected by 70% of people in Macon Bibb County. Um, the last number I heard is there was only 15 of those cots, uh, what they call cots that are beds, uh, not on the floor, that were in that holding area. The grand jury didn't find anything uh, that you're saying as far as the overcrowding and conditions for those inmates. They found the mold that you discussed. They found that they thought police officers need to make more money. They found some broken glass there and some outdated uh, physical structures there. I saw no grand jury findings um, of anything else dealing with particular people there in social distancing. Um, I know there was a news article on there and I know there's there's a lot of uh, information on there from, from groups, but our grand jury didn't, didn't dictate to me unless you got some other document that I didn't. When I refer to the grand jury document, I'm referring to black mold in a building as serious issues, exposed wiring and doors that don't lock as serious issues. And, and, um, I, and I agree with you. Okay, so. I agree with you. That's not so, COVID related though. Now, I'll grant you that, but these are, I'm speaking on, yes, they're, those are not COVID related, but they do have to do with the self and safety that we're providing the citizens in our facility. Yeah, that's okay. where I think we have two conversations right. going on. So, and I, and I guess I, I, I put these two issues together because it's our facility happening right now true black mold is not a COVID problem. The way we distribute mass, the, and when, I th when I think about overcrowding, I think about overcrowding, detaching it from the numbers, us not able to provide the services that we said we were gonna provide to everybody. And my understanding of prison services is a cot and three hots. And somehow we're messing up on the cot part. And you telling me that there are only 15 left means that people are still not assigned a bed in our prison, which is even more complex now because apparently it's not overcrowded. So we had the option to provide them with a bed, but didn't, which doesn't help this make sense to me. Well, those 15 I'm talking about are in quarantine. Uh, a prison, by the way, you, you admittedly every two weeks people get out of jail and we have a revolving uh, number of people there and we, we house on an average basis about 800. The sheriff has only had 10 people test positive uh, inmates that we can verify. Of course, if you want to say he's incorrect and doesn't test positive, that's not me. But I think he's done a pretty good job of doing that. I just think we have to be careful of using COVID as an excuse for everything when there's other conversations we need to have uh, amongst the commission on how we can improve things that we don't like at the jail and how we can approve on nonviolent felonies spending more time in jail than they otherwise would have done if they had been to court quicker. I think those are a lot more positive conversations to have instead of using, and I'm not saying COVID isn't real and it's not here for a long time, but I, I hate to use it as a crutch. And I think these arguments would have been a lot stronger last April, not when we're on a downtrend in the middle of a vaccination and our population at the jail is decreasing over there. And the grand jury didn't have any blatant violations that jump out to me related to COVID or inhumane treatment of individuals there other than the information that you discussed. And I, I don't know, like, even, so what, when I looked at the grand jury, because I don't know, I take black mold inside of a place where people sleep every day to be, like, a top-level concern. Like, like, I don't even need to talk about COVID anymore because we have black mold. And, I, right? Like, why is it no one, like, that's not a small thing, like, at all. That's even worse for your respiratory than COVID. Like, and now we have both of those. And we're not testing, I get the 10, but we're not testing anyone that enters the jail or exits the jail, except the, those 10 must have been very close to death when they actually took the admin or administered that test. And we've had way more employees that work at the jail test positive and miss time because of it, which indicates to me that there's something flowing through the air in that facility. Because again, employees have been back and forth with COVID throughout the whole year. And I don't know. I, and, and I hear you with we should have addressed it later or earlier, but it's here now. Everything that I'm mentioning is very real an issue. And I guess to, to the first point that, yes, if we were talking about completely removing all cash and restitution payments forever, that would be too far. But I think it relates to COVID because folks 
are owed their punishment, but due to the economic impacts of the COVID and what is done economically, a lot of folks have lost their jobs that may be holding folks over right now solely about money isn't the best thing to do. And I hear you on the numbers may be low, and I would, again, as part of this, encourage us all to try to get clean numbers, because I've heard some that make me think that a significant number of our people in jail and our LEC have not actually been charged or seen by a judge to be charged as guilty. They're just there waiting and not paying money. Yeah, and I think we share a lot of common points, uh, Commissioner Watt, because I don't want to be at this point with, with you, but I think you'll find that that number is very small if it's, if it's not non-existent on those particular Superior Court violators. Uh, the other thing is you'll find is, is those folks were already behind on restitution before COVID, and they were behind on child support before COVID. And I don't want to use that as a, as a crutch. Uh, I don't think we're any less safe because of that, and I don't think we're keeping anybody else uh, in jail uh, because of that. We do have a larger, broader, broader conversation that we need to have as a group with this commission, as well as the indigent defense, a public defender, the um, the court system on how we can shrink the size of our jail. Because in my plan, as you remember, it involves shrinking the size of the jail to free up officers that we're already paying good money at the jail to be out on the streets. So I, I just think that, uh, and, and yes, mold is a problem if it's mold. If it's not just mildew, somebody looked at something, they call everything mold. Um, I don't know where it was at in that facility, but that's not the conversation we're having. That's a separate conversation. That's not about letting inmates out, out and, and dropping all warrants and having a poor victim at home that's depending on restitution that somebody's never paid and now the person's incarcerated. We want to let them out because they have a hardship. Well, that person has a hardship too, and it's just something I can't go that far. So, is there like a large portion of people who pay their restitution while physically sitting in the jail? That just seems like a very unlikely scenario as well. I'm sure they're not paying it while they're in jail, right. but so it doesn't change the obligation. The fact they should have been paying it when they were out free, when they had jobs, uh, that there's such economic harm now. Um, that's all I'm saying. I think we can look at those numbers. You can request those. I mean, I'd like to know the numbers myself, so you and I are not making up numbers and being hypothetical here to know how many real people are involved. And tell me how many people in Superior Court are on technical violations for purely non-payment. Uh, and I, I, I think the number is going to be very small. And if, if there's if they're a large number, I'll be on the same side as you on that situation. But I just don't think that's, that's the way it is. Small. Even if it's just two people, why not? Then it, you don't have the overcrowding part you're talking about. You kind of lose some of your argument there with just two people as opposed to you mentioned 200 just a moment ago. I, again, I stand on the 200, but I guess to my point, if there are two people in there for what we all seem to be a silly reason, shouldn't we pass some law to get them out? Well, I think you, you elect judges and you elect sheriffs and, and they do their job. Uh, and you have an elective sheriff who got more votes than anybody sitting on this commission, including this mayor. And people have elected him to do his job and we have to hold him accountable. And you've got elected judges who run countywide in three counties, and people elect them to do their job and hold them accountable. And, that, and that's where it starts and stops for me. I don't, I don't want to keep having this conversation. I think we, we know where each other stand right now on this, and we've had some good viable conversations. I know Mr. Tillman's had his hand up for a while over there. It looks like he's making some diligent notes, and I see him smile every now and then, so I think he wants to say something. Well, thank you, thank you uh, Mr. Mayor. Um, I, I, I think... Uh, you two agree on more than you're giving leeway to, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I think you can equate uh, the federal government stopping evictions as the same as the restitutions to currently stop it. Doesn't mean it goes away. Um, there are three points why even a convicted felon uh, stays in jail without a bond. I'll mention two of them. Number one is uh, the concern is always witness intimidation. And the other one is uh, to ensure he or she is going to show up in court. There's a third one I won't mention. Uh, six to eight months ago, uh, Mr. Mayor, uh, you say this, well, you say this is outdated, but six to eight months ago, this was in concert with your second chance amendment where you said this is uh, for folks to be able to get out of the jail and work to pay child support and so forth. So it seems like, you know, as a person who has defended so many of these folks, that I'm really surprised that you, you know, 
just won't say, hey, man, let's all get together and work on this because you have proposed for the last, uh, you know, six, eight months ago that this was one of your initiatives that you wanted to take on. And, um, you know, so, so everything cannot just be when you decide you want to get on board with something, then we can move forward with it. Use that same expertise in the court system that you learn to help us formalize what we're trying to do with this plan. And do not, and, and neither one of us, none of us, need to make, the, be really making this argument without the sheriff's input. I think we all need to be somewhere uh, having a conversation, number one, to show the sheriff we are concerned with these issues because people are calling and inquiring. And number two, how can we support your second chance initiative and what we're trying to do now to bring it all up to date? Because you are, uh, and, and, and the attorneys in the room that have represented people in these cases understand what's, what's happening and what we can do. I don't think any judge, elected body, we want to just keep somebody in jail as any form of punishment, whether it's COVID, hadn't paid something or whatever. We do know that we have issues with probation officers that will say to somebody, even if they're on the street, uh, I don't care how you get it, just bring me the money or what have you. Or no, you can't go and work in that city, find a job here. You know, they, they make it difficult for folks. And so um, how do we all become together, come together and make it more simplified? And I really think this conversation needs to probably cease and let's get the sheriff on board. And, uh, and, and, and Mr. Mayor, if you can, if you're willing to at this point, go back then and share your eight months ago plan when you say it, second chance, we want to let them out of jail to work and pay off fines and child support. And so it seems like this is part of what we're we're saying also. Well, I, I that, that is just that. a piece of it. So, so you, I, I'll yield. And yeah, let you, I, you I agree with that. I wish I wish eight months ago you had supported me on that when I, I made that plan because it is a good plan, and I, I'll be happy if you want to draw up something that says everybody that's over there in jail with probation can get out and go to work, and we have a work release program for them. Sign me up for that resolution because I've been pushing that all along because I think we have people sitting over there spinning their wheels and inevitably sending more time in jail than they would have otherwise by working. And if we can get good people over there in the jail to get out and work during the day and come to jail at night until they pay their, their debt, whatever that debt may be, uh, I'm certainly behind that. Nothing has changed from my conversation eight months ago to today. This issue you hear is not going to be masked under COVID is what I'm telling you. That, that's despite COVID. I started that conversation two and a half years ago um, about work release and a program that I had to give people a second chance before COVID came around. So I'm not using that as a crutch and I'm not trying to mask my opinions based on where I was during the campaign and now because they're one and the same. I just wish more people would have got on board then because we'd be much further along than we are now in this work release program. Instead of alleging that it was uh, slave labor and forced labor and locking people up for paying child support. And those are things that are on tape that I've listened to multiple times to remind myself what I'm dealing with sometimes. And that is not true, it's out of context. So now that you're telling me that you're on board with work release program, you better believe I'll get busy on that. Make that an initiative. I've already reached out to the district attorney on this case. I've already reached out to public defender. I've already talked to the sheriff. We just need to get the judges and probations on board to make this happen. Well, let me follow up with that because um, I remember during your campaign that I said it already existed and it already exists because it's called G-Wing because those men and women can be released and go and work and have to report back into jail. So that was one of the things that I said that your plan was talking about when you talk about a second chance, that it existed. Uh, there was a Chris Doherty, who was a reverend, wanted the tr originally the train station that we was going to work with him to allow families to come and visit folks at the jail and to be able to be with their children and interact with them. So uh, I support that plan. Uh, didn't use that terminology, but well, I did. You specifically I, called it chain gang now. Well, I don't remember calling it <laughs> chain gang. Yeah. Uh, not me, but I, yeah. I remember. Uh, 
saying that it existed in the G wing because the sheriff does have that work release program that people in the G wing are allowed to go and work and come back and report in the jail. That G wing is for washing police cars and cutting grass, and that's a no, trustee no, position. No, some of these there. guys go to work. And then they have to report back to jail. Our, our work release program was totally different. I'm glad you're supportive of that now. I think that moves this conversation a lot closer where I want it to be. Uh, I appreciate Commissioner Watkins, and we can keep talking about this because it's valuable uh, bringing all these resolutions. It's just I want to let you know up front is is I have an issue with those things there. Uh, if we have a if we can have a joint meeting with the sheriff and with uh, the chief judge Howard Sims and district attorney, and there's some formulated joint statement that we can issue on behalf of this mayor and commission i'm certainly uh, amenable to that let's get it together. but i cannot and will not support this resolution based on the terms that i see it in just you know i don't get a vote unless there's a title unless there's a veto well you just said and made it clear there you go. didn't propose it okay and that's why you're not going to support it but no, what, 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 what we can do <laughs> is we can come together and let's work it out and make it fit for all of us that's what we can do and that's what i'm willing to do mr Watkins, you have a question um, I do, but I yield to anybody else. I've been talking a good bit. Huh? I think everybody else is good right now. Commissioner Lucas? Yeah. What is the sheriff going to report? Because, I mean, I think we're all at the same point now where we want the sheriff to just talk about uh, what he and his uh, staff feel are ways of addressing these. Because, I mean, they're out there. Right. So um, that's why I just thought that we would express our, our support for the work that he's, he's doing and not anything else. Just simply say that we support the efforts and um, even if we took out immediate action, uh, you know, his actions, I mean, and that would not say, well, we're, we're telling you, you got to do it right this minute because we know that it's not going to happen like that. But I still think we need to express to law enforcement that we support what they're doing. And I think we could, simple, we could do that very, in a very simple way. The attorneys could come up with just a, 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 a reworking of this that would say just what we wanted to say, and I think everybody would be in agreement with it. I hope there's nobody that's supporting, that wouldn't support uh, a general kind of a, a resolution. Well, I think we need to hear from the sheriff. I think that uh, perhaps if it's okay, we'll invite him to the regular night board meeting next week for an update. Uh, we'll, this item will be back on the agenda in two weeks. After that meeting with the sheriff next Tuesday night, it'll be back on the following Tuesday. If there's any action that's going to be required at that time, you can move forward unless Commissioner Watkins wants to push this forward with a vote today. Commissioner Wynn, you had a question? Question, you, may, you mentioned that we should have the sheriff come forward and talk to us, and I agree with that. Perhaps someone, one of the judges can come forward too that you've talked to. And somebody from the, magic, the um, who was it that went in and inspected? The grand jury wouldn't be involved in something like that. No. Somebody come in and tell us because if a black mold spot is one tile, that's not a problem. Building, that's a problem. It, it, you know, know what, what kind of real problems are there just out of curiosity. Is it just a few tiles that are water stained that need to be replaced? Is it, you know, what are the findings? How large of an area, what are we talking about? So I'd like to hear from them too or somebody report on their behalf. Right. Okay. We'll, we'll make that happen. Uh, of course, black mold is always a problem. So if it does test positive, it doesn't matter how much it is or where it's at. It's certainly a problem. And I think we all recognize oh, yeah. that. But I would like to know what it is. And yeah. I really want to know, and the sheriff, I'd ask him to uh, come up with an action plan uh, that he could provide us to let us know what he's doing, what steps he's taking, uh, approximate costs for some of the uh, mediation efforts over there, and send that to us and give us an opportunity to address that if we need to out of our budget or he has that in his budget. And he has uh, already corresponded with me. Uh, as early as today to let me know that he is working on that and we'll be happy to present that to the commission. Commissioner Watkins, do you have a follow-up? Yes. So, again, we are the legislative body that pre that makes the laws and policies for making Bibb County. The sheriff's role is to house people in his jail when they break those laws that we create. The courts administer the justice based on the policies and rules that we create. We have a lot of agency when it comes to making Bibb County. The sheriff does not, 
in this sense. He's if if the courts and we send him through our lawmaking and the courts administration of it, five thousand people. That's what he has to deal with. It is a multi-pronged approach that's necessary here. And again, I, I, just for me looking at it, a lot of this coordination starts with us asking them to coordinate. So I, I, I totally understand what Commissioner Lucas is saying and I'm in support of and accept it as a friendly amendment um, because that coordination for whatever reason is not happening right now. Um, and I don't know, I've been, I waited before I sent this off, I waited for several rounds of meetings where I was told that I would get more information, I would get more evidence. Somebody, I think y'all had a Zoom call that I was waiting to see what results was coming from that. And I, I got no response or nor can I see any real evidence. Every time I ask, people are still sleeping on the floor. We are still charging for masks and I hadn't heard the reason, no one provided me with a clear reason as to why we're charging people for masks and why we continue to do it. But apparently, I'm a part of an organization that's doing it. So I'm presenting today a set of recommendations. But largely, I'm just asking us to do better. Like, again, folks are not supposed to be sleeping on the floor in our facility, overcrowded or not. But I, I you. I hear you loud and clear, Commissioner Watkins. All I need to know at this point in time is you want to leave this as an informational item for two weeks or some motion that you want to try to get five people to go forward with? So I, I mean, I'll make the motion if I have a second on the vote. I'll. Okay, we got a motion to um, add this to the agenda. Or just add to the agenda. Okay. Uh, Commissioner Watkins would like a motion to add this to the agenda for consideration on a vote. Is there a second? To ask him, I would really like, I would really like for the sheriff to be more part of this um, before we move forward. Because I think just the conversations that we all have had today, and you know, sure. all <laughs> you right. know, we, we we still, you know, you know, everything's still new and fresh, and, and we've got to get past. And the mayor and I have talked about some of this. We've got to get past some of this campaign stuff that, that we've gone through. And we all got to come together and get on the same board, on the same page. We, we got to get past. So I think we ought to try to work on this, uh, you know, a, a little bit later. And, and with the mayor and the sheriff. I remove my motion. Okay. Because I, I want to do exactly, I, I want to help implement that work release program and support it. Uh, because I've been an, an advocate of it, and I want to support it on the levels that everybody would like to uh, see fit. Because you know, when you use language like "well, I hope you got the same, I got five votes" and stuff like that, I mean, you know, we don't we want to make sure that we are going to be supportive. Because whether you got five votes or not, the whole commission gets credit that we pass something or something fails. So, so let, let's let's try to see how we can make this because it's a hot button issue. It is. What's happening at jail, those folks are down there every day, both employees and the inmates. And we focus a lot today on inmates, but those employees are down there too, man. Thank you, Commissioner Tillman. Um, so that motion has been withdrawn. We've taken care of that issue. There's no votes. Uh, Commissioner Jones, you had your light on, but since we're not handling that, you still want to speak? Just, just one little comment. Mr. Watkins' his voice, uh, comment, his point. I don't want anybody to be sleeping on the floor in our jails, but I think we need to get the sheriff here and get a report, as many of us have said, and let's see what let's see what he is doing. I don't, I don't like our National Guard sleeping on the unheated garage floors in Washington, D.C., where three or 400 people have one bathroom either. That makes me sick. And I don't want people sleeping on the floor without a cot so I don't know if they're typically, are they right on the floor or do they have a cot that's three inches off the ground? I don't know. And I don't know the reasons why, but I think we need to hear it from the sheriff and let him tell us what he's done about the grand jury's report, what he's done, what he's doing, what, you know, let's get it straight from the horse's mouth. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Jones. We're going to move on to item B, which is another informational item. Uh, this is sponsored by, uh, Commissioner Paul Bronson, Mayor Pro Tem Clark, Commissioner Roger Watkins, and Commissioner Valerie Wynn. In parts, 
This is what I spoke about earlier. This is the ordinance of Chapter 4 of the Code to provide additional distance requirements for licensing a business selling alcohol beverages by the package to go near churches, recreation centers, to terminate license privileges of vice marks. Um, right now, this is just an informational item on, only. Uh, I think we've received copies of um, some resolutions proposed by this group. Is this something that you want to get back together and try to come up with one consolidated uh, uh, resolution for two weeks, or is this something you need to discuss today? Commissioner Brown. Yeah, yes, I will hold for, for two weeks. Okay. We'll go ahead and pass that item for, for um, two weeks for informational purposes only. Um, and we, if you want to add it at that time, if you've got a bill, we'll make that an action item on the two weeks. Thank you for that consideration. Uh, this time we have, um, unfortunately, we have a small, uh, <laughs> a very short executive session item that we must bring to your attention. Um, it, Shouldn't take, well, we don't, we're on camera, so uh, we're going to step back to back just for, for five minutes. Hopefully, we should take on with that, and we'll come back and adjourn if there's no other business. So uh, we're going to take a recess to the back. At this time, I get a motion to go into executive session. So moved. So moved by Commissioner Clark, um, seconded by Commissioner Bronson. Oh, yeah, he's right. I'm sorry, excuse me? we got to come back and just got to have a vote on something. It, it literally would take two minutes. We'll okay. be back two minutes. So we have a motion and a second. All those in favor of the motion, please say aye. aye. Opposed, nay. We're now in executive session. <laughs> I get a motion to come out of executive session. So got a motion by uh, Pro Tem Clark, second by Commissioner Bronson. Uh, we have one item out of executive session. Uh, Attorney Groover. Yes. May I have a motion to uh, not appeal, that is not appeal to Superior Court, the uh, the tax assessor's case that I just that we just discussed in uh, executive so, session. Second. Got a motion uh, by Commissioner Jones, second by Pro Tem. Any discussion on that matter? All those in favor of the motion, please say aye. aye. Opposed, nay. That motion carries, and this meeting is hereby adjourned.